Namaste. So Lakshmi Tantra continues in chapter 21 with detailed explanation of the parts of a mantra. It's kind of a technical discussion, but we'll see that this knowledge will come in handy later when she starts discussing her mantras and specifically her Anga mantras, the assistant mantras, so to speak, that give them a lot of their power. So, without further ado, let's look into it. Parts of a mantra are basically divided into two kinds, essential and optional. The essential parts are Aung and the Bija. And the optional parts are called Pinda, Sangya, and Pada. Now, each of these parts represents a layer of consciousness. Bija represents Turiya, Pinda represents Sushupti, Sangya represents Swapna, and Pada represents Jagra. This is why, incidentally, a mantra without a Bija is not considered a first-class mantra. And this is very salient because we see a lot of different cults that come up with their own mantras or counterfeit mantras. Uh, for example, the 16-syllable Soda Shakshi Mantra. The Soda Shakshi Mantra in the Sri Vidya tradition is like one of the most powerful mantras there is. So it's a 16-syllable mantra. But then some sectarian groups also promote a 16-syllable mantra, but it has no bijas, none whatsoever. So in that case, their mantra comes under different rules and is considered a second or third class mantra. So anyway, what are these parts and what are some examples that illustrate them? Examples of bija are hring, shring, kling, ein, gang, and krong. <laughs> That's from Lord Narasingha's mantra. Parts that illustrate the pinda are sau, sa, ksha, la, ha, and ka. And illustrations of the sangya part are Narayanaya, or Adishatayai, or Vasudevaya. And in some mantras that consist of only vowels, Ai Uri E O Ung, Ganapataye, and there's one mantra that I found, Chindibindi. <laughs> so the Sangya parts of the mantra can reflect either the deity's name or they can be other syllables, not bijas because they don't end in ng, huh? but they are still important parts of the mantra. And they will be explained, all of these will be explained in great detail in the future chapters. And finally, examples of the pada would be namaha, viche, hridayaya, swaha, Kavachaya and Pahat. Pahat is very, very powerful, Pada, because it makes the mantra into a weapon. And similarly, Kavachaya makes the mantra into a shield, Kavacha. So all the parts of the mantra are significant. And we'll see many examples in upcoming chapters. And so you'll want to refer back to these definitions so that you understand the different parts of the mantra and how they work. Then she discusses Kshetra and Kshetragnya mantras. And really these are other, another part of the mantra, the part that refers to the soul or the conscious living entity, and the part that refers to the body or the manifested material uh, enclosure. <laughs> the shells or kosha 
like anamaya kosha for the gross body, pranamaya kosha for the energy body, and so on. We've discussed these many times. The kshetra and kshetra gya parts of the mantra are distinguished in the following ways. In mantras containing a bija, the bija refers to the soul, such as in aung, aing, ring, kling, chamundae, vitche. Ain refers to the soul, and the rest of the mantra refers to the body. In mantras without a bija, the first sound represents the soul. Aum Lakshmi Namaha. The La in Lakshmi represents the soul. And in mantras consisting of only a bija or a pinda section, the A is regarded as the soul and the rest of the body. For example, Aum Anapagai Minyai Namaha. The beginning A in Anapagai Minyai is referred to as the soul and the rest of the body is in the mantra. There are more types of mantras uh, with different divisions between the soul and the body sections, but they're not so important for our purposes. We want to take the big view. Instead of getting completely wound up into the technicalities, we want to step back and try to see what is Mother Lakshmi doing here? In these chapters, actually between 18 and 25, she's going deeply into the structure of the mantra, how it's derived, how it works, and the meaning of the letters of the words of the mantra. And this is very significant because in no other scripture have I seen such a detailed description. And uh, any other tradition that might have uh, similar descriptions are in different languages, such as Kannada or Tamil, or you know other languages that I don't speak or read. So as far as those books that we have an English translation for, this is the best description of mantra. Why is mantra important? Remember, the four different kinds of paths to self-realization that she discussed back in, I think it's chapter 15, that the first three, which is observance of the Vedic Varnashrama Dharma social system and all the rituals that go along with it, is very difficult and expensive in this age of Kali. Nobody knows really all the mantras and all the rituals and why you should perform them and so on, so they don't. And to add to it, now the varnas have become uh, based on birth instead of on quality and work, as Bhagavad Gita states. And so the whole thing has become really phony and awkward and unworkable. And so really it's dropped out of usage and it's not very practical. The second path she recommends is analysis of the material world and the elements by means of Sankhya philosophy. And Sankhya philosophy is very elevated and difficult. And again, in Kali Yuga, very few people have the skills and the background that allows them to perform this kind of meditation. Then she gives the example, the third path of the yoga system, the Eightfold Yoga System, Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, uh, dharana, dhyana, and samadhi. But again, how many people can do this? I mean, so-called yoga is taught in the West and even in India as simply an exercise. And you're supposed to get enlightened from exercises? How is that possible? Actually, they're just focusing their attention on the gross body, the anamaya kosha, and maybe a little bit on the pranamaya kosha, and then becoming identified with them and thinking that some manipulation of the gross and subtle bodies can produce enlightenment. But see, that's the ascending path, avaroha panta, and that doesn't really work. 
because we don't have the willpower, we don't have the concentration, we don't have the knowledge or the facilities in Kali Yuga to perform all these paths. So finally she says, I give the fourth path, and she gives a little story how she's talking with Narayana and asking him, how can we deliver, how can we rescue these fallen souls in the age of Kali? And he says, you know, I've already done this, you know. <laughs> I've given all the Vedas and Upanishads and inspired the, the sages to compose the Vedanta. So really, you know, anybody can take advantage of these and like that. But she's, she's more merciful. She's more compassionate. And she says, well, because people in general can't perform these difficult paths, especially in Kali Yuga. There has to be a path that anybody can perform, that anybody can realize success. And that is the path of Sharanagati, self-surrender. And how is that path implemented? By mantras. So in other words, in the age of Kali Yuga, mantra is really the only viable means to approach self-realization. Now, of course, there is always a final stage of meditation, but when mantras are realized, that meditation occurs spontaneously, automatically, bringing us to the highest level of self-realization, samadhi. I've experienced this myself. And the results of chanting mantra are that one gets her direct blessing and she will reveal her actual form. So, I mean, this is a great thing. This is a wonderful thing. And when I say her actual form, I don't mean like the forms that you see in temples or in artworks depicting the goddess. I mean, she reveals her actual functional form as consciousness, all-pervading knowledge. And this is a very big deal. Uh, when one gets this vision, it means that one is basically on his way out of this material world. He is almost guaranteed to attain moksha in this life. And it's a very wonderful, very auspicious sign that one has the blessing and the grace of the goddess, who is all-pervading consciousness. See, the scientists go to so much trouble to come up with all these theories of the origin of the world. They go through, through so much labor. Actually, they're trying to follow the path of Sankhya, but because they are not learned in the realm of consciousness, they get it wrong every single time. They say the universe came from a big bang, you know. <laughs> well, even if there was a big bang, who set it off? But in reality, the meditator knows beyond the shadow of a doubt that the origin of the world is consciousness. Consciousness is the root of all creation. And this is something that one realizes intuitively and grasps without thinking. It simply becomes obvious at a certain point that everything comes from consciousness. And so consciousness, when it is conditioned and restricted in different ways by upadis, we did a whole video on that, is the actual substance of which everything is composed. And although, of course, we can look at it from a material point of view and see it in one way as, as material objects and so on, or we can look at it from the point of view of consciousness, and the advantage in looking at it from consciousness is that once we identify with pure consciousness, there is no more birth and death. We see clearly that birth and death are simply thoughts related to the gross body, and that we, consciousness, are immortal, unlimited, unconditioned, and fully empowered to create anything that we want. 
But this is a very advanced stage, and it's not to be imitated like the neo Edwaitans do. Uh, so this is really the key. She is giving all the greatest truths and the highest knowledge to facilitate our approach to complete self-realization. Aum Tetsa, Aum Shakti, Aum.